At the beginning of this anime, we will meet our protagonist named Iska. He is an overpowered swordsman considered the most powerful in his nation. He possesses a sword technique known as the Attractive Sword Style, considered one of the most powerful in the world. However, he fights for the empire that has wronged him in the past. But let's start from the beginning, shall we? One year earlier, Iska rescued a pink-haired witch who was imprisoned by the empire. After doing so, he was stripped of his rank for being considered a traitor. However, he was so powerful that he was given a second chance for redemption, with the condition that he must eliminate the Calamity Witch of Ice. After accomplishing this mission, he regains his attractive swords. To fulfill this task, he demands at least three members in his party. These three members are two girls named Nene and Ms. Ms., and the latter is a white-haired boy named Jean. It becomes clear that the group has previously undertaken various missions to eliminate witches. However, this time, things will be a bit more complicated because the witch they are after is a pure-blooded witch rumored to have defeated entire armies on her own. The next day, the group heads to a forest near the reactor, but suddenly, they are attacked by magicians. Jean is immediately targeted by a fire spell, but Iska intervenes and cuts through the flames using his attractive swords. Jean tries to shoot the magicians with his guns, but his bullets are blocked. Suddenly, numerous other magicians emerge from underground, but Iska and Jean were already prepared for this ambush. Nene then throws a flare into the air, creating a smokescreen. Taking advantage of the chaos, Iska moves to the right, while Jean goes to the left. The protagonist prepares to counterattack a magician attempting to launch a fireball at him. He leaps into the air to dodge the attack and strikes the wizard, finishing him off. Right behind him, a witch appears, attempting to hit him, but Iska is quicker and defeats her. Just when it seemed like they had the situation under control and defeated all those guys in red, a gigantic golem appears with a witch on top, dressed like a maid or something. Iska then slashes diagonally at the golem, instructs his friends to leave while ensuring he'll handle everything alone. The woman on the golem starts conjuring numerous spears and fires them at Iska, who skillfully dodges them all. My friends, it's with great pride that I I say we finally have a skilled protagonist here. Besides dodging the witch's attacks, Iska quickly appears behind her. She tries to remove her dress to distract and finish him, but Iska is very attentive, immobilizing the girl from behind and pointing his sword at her. At that moment, the protagonist was ready to fulfill his duty. However, he was interrupted by the arrival of the Ice Calamity, which, yes, the witch he had a mission to eliminate. To prevent Iska, the witch starts freezing the entire forest around them, praising her maid for a job well done. Iska doesn't understand it since he had defeated the girl, but the witch reveals that she managed to freeze everything, including the reactor, her main objective. Upon hearing that, Iska starts chasing the witch because he's angry about it. The witch proves to be more skillful than expected, conjuring various ice swords and attacking him. Iska attempts to cut the swords, but he ends up getting injured by several of them. To counterattack, he mimics her move with his swords from behind. When he tries to jump for the final blow, the witch blocks his attack with an ice shield. The witch then questions why Iska continues to fight if he can't harm her, so he reveals that he will continue continue fighting until he puts an end to the stupid war that was happening. Upon hearing his response, the witch is a bit impressed with his words. She then leaps to a higher place on a rock and introduces herself. Her name is Alice, and she states that she won't stop fighting until she frees the world from the tyranny of the Empire. Beautiful words from the witch, but when she tries to take a step forward, she missteps, and her ice breaks. She ends up falling, and reflexively, Iska saves her. At that moment, her veil falls, revealing her face, and she is incredibly beautiful. She panics with embarrassment, then leaves Iska and calls her servant. The two of them fly away on a giant chicken that Alice summoned. Next, the rest of Iska's group finally arrives. Everyone is surprised by Alice's power in freezing the forest and the reactor. Meanwhile, Alice is now in her castle or a similar place with her servant, Rin, fixing her hair. Now we finally learn the name of her servant, Rin. While they are together, Alice mentions feeling disturbed by the encounter with Iska. Something had changed in her after meeting the protagonist. However, she doesn't want to dwell on it, so she decides to distract herself by watching an opera show. While listening to the bad music, she ends up getting emotional, and suddenly someone behind her hands her a handkerchief to wipe her tears. However, the show is dark, so she can't see who gave her the handkerchief. But soon, the lights come on, and guess who the kind knight was who gave her the handkerchief? By the twist of fate, they meet again. Both Iska and she now look foolish, staring at each other. Then, we see that the night before the opera, Iska was having trouble sleeping, and had a sad expression on his face. Ms. Niz, being a good friend, tries to console her captain in every way. And so, Ms. Niz invites invites Iska to go to her room to give him a special gift. Iska, being a knight, accompanies her to the room. However, when they arrive, Ms. Ms. quickly becomes desperate because she forgot to hide her underwear from her captain. She left everything hanging on the clothesline, and he ended up seeing it all. Well, she's actually there to invite him to an event that will take place the next day, which will be ultra-romantic. And from her expression, it's clear what her intentions are with Iska. Yes, dear readers, it seems like she has a crush on Iska, doesn't it? Sorry, folks, but I couldn't resist making that pun with the protagonist's name. 
After delivering the invitation, Mrs. asks her captain to be in the neutral city to meet her the next day. Iska agrees, so he returns to his room to try to get some sleep. However, when he tries to rest, he starts dreaming about his former master handing him his astral sword. In his master's words, Iska is told never to abandon that sword because it is essential for bringing peace to the world once again. After that, the scene shifts back to Iska, who is now back at the opera with Alice. After Alice unknowingly accepts the handkerchief Iska had given her, she sees Iska in front of her and is ready to start a scene. Fortunately, Rin is nearby and manages to restrain Alice, reminding her that they are in neutral territory. In other words, conflicts are not allowed in that city. After that, Alice calms down a bit and leaves with Rin to grab something to eat. However, they haven't made a reservation anywhere, so they go to the nearest restaurant. When they arrive, they realize everything is full, so they have to share a table with someone. They sit down, get settled, and suddenly, the person who reserved that table arrives. Obviously, it's our protagonist, Iska, who had reserved it for himself and Mimi. Once again, Alice goes crazy upon realizing that she's bumping into Iska once more. However, this time she remembers that they are in neutral territory, and she decides to set aside their differences, at least for that meal. As they temporarily make peace, they begin to converse, gradually realizing that they share some commonalities. They desire the same things. Essentially, both of them are individuals who want the best for the world, but find themselves on opposing sides for some reason. It turns out that they are so alike in their preferences that they both end up ordering noodles to eat. After enjoying that delicious pasta, Alice returns to her home, which resembles the palace from Frozen. She then tells herself to keep that encounter between them to herself because, no matter how similar she and Iska might be, they are still enemies. Well, that denies it, so she agrees with that notion. The next day, we see that Iska and his squad are training, carrying enormous backpacks on their backs. This is all because of their supervisor named Hizia. Hizia is now leading the group and is quite pleased to see that everyone there is active and strong as before. However, she knows that Iska is having trouble sleeping. To help him with that, she gives him a ticket to an art exhibition. Meanwhile, Alice is visiting her mother, Laura, to discuss her battle against Iska. Laura is concerned about Iska's abilities since his power should be on the same level as his master, who used to have the strength to defeat Empire elite soldiers alone. She then shares the story of her nation's founder and her younger twin sister with Alice. She explains that 100 years ago, the founder had fought alone against thousands of soldiers and still lived after that. It had been her sister who initiated the royal lineage from that point onwards, and she was what they called a pure blood ancestor of the race. However, the Empire didn't know that she had a twin sister, so they celebrated their victory as if it were a definitive triumph. However, the connection the witches had with the founder was beginning to weaken since Alice had fought against Iska. And the worst part is that even after hearing her mother's entire nojutsu speech, by fate's chance, the next day, Iska and Alice meet again. But this time, Alice doesn't choose to stay with Iska, not even amicably. Instead, she wanders alone through the neutral city, only to get lost. After spending some time in the art museum, Iska tries to find Alice again because he's concerned and thinks she might be lost or in danger. It doesn't make much sense because Alice is as strong as he is, actually. But let's respect chivalry here, shall we? Well, soon, we see that Alice accidentally reveals that she is a princess. They couldn't stay together in the museum because they were natural enemies. However, Iska is quite slick in his argument and counters by saying that art is no borders. The guy is like Neymar, you know, in his ideas. Check this out, the guy is unforgettable. After that, they end up going to the museum together anyway. And after examining the art, all that beautiful stuff, Alice gives Iska some drink as a thank you for showing her the way to the museum. After drinking the entire bottle as if it were a Jirai, Iska ends up falling asleep and unintentionally rests his head on Alice. At that moment, he was so vulnerable that she could have finished him if she wanted, he wouldn't have the strength to react. Later on, we see that Iska brings beer for his entire squad while they gather for a meeting. This leaves Iska quite annoyed with him because the meeting is with the Imperial Senate, and in his encounter with Iska's eight apostles, she feels that he failed completely because he couldn't protect Alice's reactor when they first met. However, the mission he had actually received was to stop Alice. Just that. He had actually completed that mission, and after finishing it, he could then secure a higher position there. Now he receives a new mission, a greater challenge this time, which is to learn about the Witch of Glacial Calamity. However, Iska no longer has any desire to do so, so he skips training with the team because he needs to go to the neutral city. All of this is because he feels that Alice will be arriving there as well. However, Miss Miss doesn't want him to walk alone in that area, and she agrees to let him go with the condition that she can accompany him. The scene cuts, and in the morning, we see that Rin now has a dossier about Iska. She tells Alice that he was one of the most talented swordsmen in the entire empire. However, after his promotion, he never set foot on a battlefield for some reason. He was then arrested for releasing an astral mage from prison. Alice is shocked by this information, and now she wants Rin to find out about the mage who was freed by him. However, it will take some time for Rin to uncover this, so she asks for at least a few days from Alice. At this 
this moment, Alice's mother is starting to think that her daughter is becoming too interested in the Imperial Swordsman. She begins to remind Alice of the atrocities the Empire committed against mages in the past. Alice then acts clueless, and after her mother leaves, she orders Rin to take her to the neutral city because she wants to confirm things with Iska based on what she heard. Meanwhile, we see that Iska is going with Ms. Ms. to the neutral city. While they are inside the car, once again, they look at the sky and see a giant nugget flying. Iska already knows that the giant nugget is his beloved's. When they all meet, Alice feels that they have a unique connection with each other. She puts aside their differences for a moment and introduces herself to Ms. Miss. They then leave the city together, and Alice asks Iska why he freed the astral mage previously. Iska reveals that he did it because he was only 13 at the time, and his powers were still weak. Only Iska then remembers that the Empire at that time had captured all the mages. It didn't matter if they were good or bad, and he couldn't agree with that methodology, so he had freed the mage. He then reveals that his great dream is for there to be a peace negotiation between the kingdoms, so that the war that had been going on for so long would finally come to an end. At that moment, Alice reveals that she is happy to know that people like Isk exist within the Empire, and now she wants him to work for her so that together they can achieve the long-awaited peace. Upon hearing that, Rim panics and says that her mother would never accept such a thing. However, Alice assures her that she will find a way to handle the situation. Just before Iska could respond, the Founder suddenly appeared out of nowhere and started causing chaos, using explosive magic. They barely managed to escape the danger. Iska then wonders why she is attacking Alice since they should be on the same side, allies. But soon, we understand that she is nebulous. She is only called the Founder because she founded her nation. That's it. Nothing more than that, you see. Iska and Alice then try to stop the Founder from causing more destruction. However, the Founder blames Alice for joining the Empire. She launches a deadly fire attack that destroys the entire surrounding area. Fortunately, Alice is saved by Rim, who stands in front of her and takes the attack head on. Quickly thinking, Alice freezes Rim's body with her ice magic. Iska then asks Miss Miss to take Rim to a hospital. She tells her to spread the message that Alice was dangerous and asks people to evacuate. After Miss Miss takes Rim away, the founder looks at Iska's sword and thinks that maybe that was the reason she had awakened from her sleep. It is then revealed that those swords belong to Crossrail, who is none other than Iska's master seen in that flashback. And then it's revealed that whoever possessed that sword could have the power to defeat the founder, according to her. So, Iska and Alice continue to pursue the founder, who suddenly unleashes a fire dragon against Iska. However, he cuts the creature using his swords once again. While Alice summons ice pillars to try to cancel out the fire attacks, the founder becomes increasingly furious at seeing an astral mage and an imperial swordsman working together. She stops using only fire magic and also starts using ice and earth magic. In the end, the founder proves to be much stronger and they can't withstand her power. She summons a massive storm that almost overwhelms them. However, as they are in the neutral city, Iska wants Alice to put aside their differences now. They need to protect the people there, as it should be a safe zone for everyone. With the same ultimate goal, they advance together towards the founder to defeat her. Iska goes after her, skillfully dodging her attacks, while Alice gives him an icy look to allow him to approach the founder. Combining their powers, they manage to defend against her attacks. Finally, Iska finds the perfect opportunity and defeats the founder by cutting her wings. After the battle, Iska refuses to join Alice, but suggests a temporary truce for now to resolve their differences, as he is also exhausted from the fight against the founder. Following the battle, Iska goes to a place where influencers promote lies about making money to deceive everyone. He goes there with his team and almost wins. However, things are always like that in this place. You almost win to try again. Two weeks before, Rizia had approached Ms. Miz and told her that she would be working under her orders on the next mission, and their training would begin next month for the upcoming mission. So, they should try to make the most of the free time they had. While they are there, in a place where people only lose money thinking they'll win, the group is now concerned about what the next mission might be that would require such special preparation. Iska starts wondering what they were doing there after all. Mrs. quickly reveals that they are there because she hopes to win something to buy a battle tank for the squad. She doesn't want to buy any simple souvenirs. She wants a war tank. All of this is because she is concerned about the next mission. She says that if it's at least very difficult with a tank, they can safely escape. And, since it's been a while since that happened, Rin is taking Alice exactly to the same place where they are. Although she doesn't like playing that much and prefers to stay in the neutral city. However, Rin thinks that all Alice really wants is to meet Iska, but Alice reminds Rin that her intentions are actually pure, and she would fight Iska the next time they met as enemies. While Iska is playing with Ms. Ms., the girls are passing by. Now, instead of playing, Alice wants to think about a perfect encounter for the battle she will have against Iska, so she wonders which days would work to face him. We can see that at this moment, she is treating their upcoming battle as if it were some kind of date. Then, Rin intervenes and reminds her that it's actually a fight that will happen, not a wedding. Meanwhile, Alice, in a relaxed state of mind, tries to play. Unlike the others, she ends up 
having a lot of luck, and a lot of money starts pouring in. At this moment, Ring goes out to gather the team and people to gather around Alice. Everyone is very surprised to see how much she is winning. At this moment, Nene, another member of Iska's squad, is also around. And as she watches that blonde girl winning all those coins, she says that if she could win all that, she could buy what her captain wanted. In this case, it was a tank. Then Alice, upon hearing this, doesn't pay much attention and simply gives a chest full of coins to Nene. After all, she lives in the frozen wasteland, and she doesn't need any coins or anything like that. Meanwhile, Ms. Ms. is lying on the ground, desperate for having lost all her money, because that's what happens, right? While Ms. Ms. is crying over the losses, Nene arrives with all the coins she had won. She reveals to the group that she got that money from someone who had hit the jackpot. For some reason, that person had randomly shared the prize with her. Iska, upon hearing this, thinks that the person who did that must be very generous. While Ms. Ms. thinks that person probably is some oil magnate or something. However, Nene tells them that this person was very beautiful, with blonde hair, and as elegant as a princess. Upon hearing this description, thoughts start circulating in Alice's mind, but Iska manages to resist and simply ignores those thoughts. On the other hand, after winning big and giving it to Nene, Alice decides to visit a fortune teller and tells her about a boy one year younger than her that she wishes to meet. The fortune teller turns over two lucky cards and tells Alice that the person she's looking for is always close to her, and they have a strong destiny connection that cannot be broken, not even by themselves. After reading her fortune, she steps away from the building just before Iska and his squad arrive at the same place. Now, it's Iska's turn to try his luck, and when he does, he gets exactly the same result as Alice. Meanwhile, Iska is gathering with the eight apostles to discuss a vortex that had appeared nearby. While the squad is sitting together, Iska explains to them what a vortex is. She says that when the war started decades ago, there was a diversion of astral energy, and this disturbance came to be called the vortex. It was this vortex that granted powers to the great witch Nebeligia, the founder. Now the empire cannot allow them to get their hands on this vortex because it could give rise to another which is powerful as the founder. Meanwhile, Ren is explaining to Alice that her sister, named Sisbel, had sent her a message about a vortex that had appeared in the southwest of their nation. She also mentioned that the empire was sending troops to the location. Alice had not been informed of this earlier, and due to the lack of information, they start blaming the Zoa family for the delay in the report. They believe that the Zoa family kept the vortex to themselves since it is created in the area they administer. Alice and Rin decide to visit the head of the Zoa family. When they arrive, they are greeted by the family leader, a masked man we'll call Mr. Mast, who approaches Alice with a dagger from behind. Fortunately, Rin is alert and senses Mr. Mast's presence, making him retreat. After this incident, Alice is confused, not understanding Mr. Mast's true intentions. Mr. Mast, not wanting to appear weak, claims he carries the dagger because he's not skilled in combat and needs a tool for self-defense. They inquire about the vortex in the region, and Mr. Mast reveals that it may not be a vortex. However, he sent troops to the location to confirm. He explains that the report was delayed because he took some time to prepare the documents to be sent. The guy is a master at bluffing. We have to give him credit. The scene shifts to the next day, where we see the squadron gathering at the meeting point for their next mission. Along the way, they encounter a childhood friend of Miss Miss named Nora. Nora introduces herself to the group, and all troops are instructed to align themselves by the operation commander named Nameless. And for some reason, he's dressing up there as if he were a Power Ranger. I think he confused the anime and thinks they were a bit satisfied. I don't know. But anyway, Nameless tells them to look for the Vortex before the witches find it. And if they manage to find the Vortex before them, they need to destroy them anyway. And then, finally, they suggest that everyone not get in their way because he intends to destroy everything on his own in the end. The Vortex, the Astral Mages, anything around there, he doesn't want anyone to help him. The team then resumes the search for the Vortex. However, they can't can't find anything useful at that moment. While they are inside a cave, Nora informs Miss Miss that a unit had approached them. However, they had lost communication with two other units that had been sent to try to find them. So, when all troops are gathered at the base, the nameless Power Ranger orders everyone to continue their work, and he does so without giving any orders to rescue the missing soldiers. Iska is disgusted with this and wants to question Nameless about his decision. He believed that as he was in the high ranks, just like Nameless, he would probably be heard. However, when Iska tries to talk to him, he ends up being completely ignored. As if that wasn't enough, he hears from Nameless that he is no longer in a position to make any demands. Then, Miss Miss decides to use all her authority as captain and asks Nameless to issue an order to rescue the missing soldiers. Even after Miss Miss, who was the captain there, made the request, Nameless acted as if he hadn't heard anything and just followed his own will. Now the scene cuts, and we go back to Alice, who has just learned about Vortis and now urges Japanese to go there with Rin. And she wants to do it as soon as possible because she can't let the Zo family use Vortis as they please. When Alice arrives at Vortis, immediately following her is the masked man, and he is accompanied by a black-haired girl who
who is wearing a blindfold. Her name is Kiss. Even though it's revealed that Kiss knew Alice since childhood, for some reason, she's scared and hides behind the mask because she wants to defend Vortis alone. So, Alice says she doesn't doubt the power that Kiss might have. However, she wonders if she would be strong enough to face the Imperial Army alone to protect that Vortis. In response, she hears that Kiss has powers that may even surpass hers in the future. The scene cuts again, and now we go back to Miss Miss and her squad, who were investigating what was happening. They discovered that the mages behind them had infiltrated one of their bases. Now, they were considering the possibility that the mages had kidnapped their missing soldiers. Jean then wonders what the next steps of the others should be. Suddenly, his eyes shift to a translucent light coming from Vortis in a nearby valley. Being the first unit to discover the exact location of Vortis, he thinks that headquarters will surely give them due recognition. The problem is that the mages behind them had already reached Vortis at that point. Shortly after them, another group arrived, and it turns out to be Nora and her unit. Miss Miss is thrilled to see her childhood friend there. She runs to her and hugs her with excitement. Nora initially responds to the hug, but the fun soon ends because both Nora and her entire squad suddenly reveal themselves as mages. Now, she's choking Miss Miss and launching lightning at her body. Nameless hates traitors, and he immediately goes to eliminate her entire squad. Then, he focuses on Nora. Her subordinate conjured a massive explosion to allow her to escape. Still, Nameless is too powerful and ends his life in the blink of an eye. He also throws a dagger at Nora, who was trying to reach her car. However, as the dagger could end up hurting Miss Miss, the bait intervenes and deflects it, allowing Nora to escape with Miss Mississippi. Fortunately, Nameless was clever and managed to place a tracker on her car, thinking that the bait had gone mad again for putting a friend in front of the entire mission. And so, Nameless approached Iska and asked if he wanted to return to prison. However, Iska responded that in the ninja world, those who abandon their friends are treated like trash, but those who leave them behind are even worse than trash. Okay, I'm kidding, you didn't say that exactly, but it was something along those lines, I swear. Iska stated that he wouldn't accept any other way to rescue Miss Miss unless it ensured her safety. For some reason, this time, Nameless agreed to Iska's demands. He then informed Iska that he had 20 minutes to rescue his friend from the Vortex, now in the hands of the Imperial Mages. According to his original mission, if the Vortex fell into Imperial Mage hands, he had to destroy it. With little choice, Iska accepted the challenge, and they rushed to rescue Mei Mei. As soon as Miss Miss reached the Vortex location, she encountered Alice and Rin. However, before she could react, Rin said something to counter her. Seeing Miss Miss, Rin knew that Iska was nearby. It seemed that fate would once again bring Iska and Alice together, but this time for a fight. While Alice and Rin searched for the protagonist, Nora took care of Miss Mississippi. Nora seemed to have other intentions with Miss Miss that were not entirely clear. Rin and Alice searched for Iska in the Imperial Army base, and Iska arrived there to rescue Miss Mississippi. After freeing Miss Miss from the clutches of that cunning girl, he confronted Nora, who unleashed various lightning bolts. However, Iska managed to dodge the bolts with his astral sword. Just when he was about to give Nora a final lesson, Kiss suddenly appeared. As a pureblood witch, she whispered some words, making Iska retreat with her power. It seems that things are getting intense for our protagonist. On the other hand, Alice and Rin are not in a much different situation. As they reach the rival base, a mysterious person suddenly attempts to attack Alice. By sheer reflex, Rin manages to save the princess once again. However, this time, in doing so, she ends up getting hurt. It seems like all the lovebirds want is to reunite once more, but the situation is proving to be quite challenging for them. Oh, and if you want to know what happens next, go ahead and hit that like button and drop a comment below requesting a part 2. We're wrapping up the first part of this recap here because this video has already exceeded 30 minutes. But if you enjoyed it, no worries, I can bring you a part 2. Just let me know in the comments.